Good morning, Ezekiel day 3, chapter 7 to 9. Now remember, Ezekiel is not in Jerusalem. He has been taken captive. In fact, he never went back to the promised land. He spent the rest of his life living in Babylon, and he's by the river Kabar, but he, he's having these visions, and he's in fact being teleported by the Holy Spirit into Jerusalem, and God is showing him things that are happening in Jerusalem and when he comes out of that, that vision, he then speaks to the people back in Babylon what he has seen. And it was during um, Ezekiel's lifetime that Jerusalem was in fact taken by Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, this is one of the things that he actually sees happening. And then weeks later, when a messenger arrives in Babylon and says, the city's been taken, uh, Ezekiel had already told the people weeks earlier when it had happened because he'd been taken there in the spirit. Well, this is one of the visions that Ezekiel has and he is prophesying what it will be like if you could have put, had a camera on a wall and watched the scene in Jerusalem when it was put under siege and eventually taken. This, as he describes it today, is part of what you would have seen. So let's read uh, chapter 7 from verse 19 onwards. They will throw their silver into the streets and their gold will be like refuse. Their silver and their gold will not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They will not satisfy their souls nor fill their stomachs because it became their stumbling block of iniquity. Their wealth, their silver and their gold became their stumbling block of iniquity. As for the beauty of his ornaments, so of, I think probably talking about God's ornaments, although the New King James does not have a capital H there. But as for the beauty of his ornaments, he set it in majesty. But they made from it the images of. Of their abominations, their detestable things. So Ezekiel says, I mean, this is God saying that God had given them the silver and gold of the nations. He had blessed David and Solomon, his son, and they had built the temple and they had adorned it like no structure on earth had ever been adorned. I mean, this thing was covered in gold. And yet the children of Israel had taken all of this gold and they'd taken the the wealth that God had given them, and they had used it then to go and make idols. The very gold that God, had, that God had given them, they were making idols from it. And this is what God charges with them. He says, as for the beauty of his ornaments, he set it in majesty, but they, the children of Israel, made from it the images of their abominations, their detestable things. Therefore, I... God have made it like a refuse to them. I will give it as plunder into the hands of strangers and to the wicked of the earth as spoil, and they shall defile it. I will turn my face from them and they will defile my secret place for robbers shall enter it and defile it. So quite clearly, Ezekiel says that God is saying because the children of Israel did not appreciate the wealth that God gave them, that they will have to treat their wealth like refuse. It will mean nothing to them. It will not help them. And in fact, God is going to turn over all the silver and the gold to robbers, to the Babylonian soldiers who will come in and, uh, and strip the city and strip the temple. Okay, so here's what I want to highlight. The children of Israel had taken the wealth that God had given them for his own glory. Okay? This wealth was to be used for the glory of God. It was actually for his temple. And they made idols with it. And therefore God saw to it that they would feel the impotence of their wealth on the day that he judged them. God made a point of bringing an experience to pass in the city of Jerusalem when it fell. He made a point of causing the people to look at the silver and gold and the wealth that they had accumulated. 
and, and realize how impotent wealth is to save. Especially to save on the day of judgment, on the day that God judges. And that they, they were so frustrated at the inability of their gold and silver to save them, that they were th throwing it down in the streets. It's worthless. It's useless. As they were running from Babylonian soldiers, wielding swords, ravishing women in the streets. You cannot serve both God and money. That sound familiar? That's what Jesus said. You cannot serve both God and money. You've got to choose. These people were serving money. So the question I want us to ask ourselves this morning is, how do I know if I am, in fact, serving money and not God? Well, in the verses that we read this morning, I mean, there's many answers you could give to that question as you range through the Bible. But if we were to focus on the verses from this morning, here are five things that we do see in these verses that were happening in Jerusalem at the time of its fall. Number one, ingratitude. Are you grateful for what God has given you? Now, in that regard... I want to read to you a story from the life of Jesus. This is from the Gospel of Luke. Because this highlights ingratitude. And it will help you diagnose, honestly, as you search your heart this morning, whether such ingratitude does live in your breast, shall we say. Then one from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And Jesus said to them, Take heed, be careful, and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my bonds and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Beware of covetousness. Why do you want more money? Why do you want your brother to share the inheritance with you? I mean, it's quite radical, actually. Don't look at what others have and desire what they have. Now, that comes back to point number one, ingratitude. Covetousness is ingratitude, and it is a lack of faith. It's ingratitude for the goodness that God has shown you. For what he has given you. It is not being satisfied. And it is a lack of faith. Because it's saying I need more money in order to be safe. In order to have joy. In order to be successful in this life. Whereas God says to you, yes, work hard. Be ambitious, set goals. But all the while you have to have a satisfaction. A a rest in your heart, a gratitude for what God has given you. Right, number two, forsaking the worship or house of God. So these Israelites had taken the gold that God had given them for the temple and they'd made idols with it. The house of God was neglected. So obviously, New Testament, what is the house of God for us? It's not a perfect analogy, and be careful with this, but the church is, in some senses, 
the place of the gathering of the saints now. It's more akin actually to a synagogue than the temple. But the point being, you can use your money for the building up of God's kingdom, for the glory of God. And one of the most natural expressions of that is to support the work of your local church. So do you support your local church? Or are you using the money God has given you to use for his glory for other things? Number three, using money for ungodly things. I mean, that's quite simple. If you spend your money on a holiday to Las Vegas to gamble it away and to spend the night with prostitutes, you are worshipping money, not God, quite clearly. Because that's what these people were doing. They were using money for ungodly pursuits, not for godly pursuits. Their money was being used for idolatry and for all of the sexual orgies that used to happen in all of that idolatry. Number four, trusting in money for safety. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, we are to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Now, the Lord has been very good to me. In my life, I've never had to genuinely search for my daily bread. And yet, even we, even you, a multimillionaire, are told to pray this Lord, give us this day our daily bread. It is a stark reminder in the daily prayer we are to pray, reminding us that our provision does not come from our wealth. God can take it away like that. Money grows wings and flies away. Don't put your hope in it. Your heart has to be each day. God, you've been good to me. You've given me much wealth. But God, I still confess that my provision comes from you. Give me today my daily bread, Father. It's a wonderful attitude of heart. And then lastly, stinginess. You know, the children of Israel here, we see them throwing their money in the streets. They wouldn't give it to the poor. They wouldn't support the widows and the orphans. But when the time came, they threw it in the streets. Stinginess. Are you generous with your money? Well, I trust that you will serve God and fear God rather than money. Because it may be. But I won't see you tomorrow. Your soul may be required of you this night. And if that is the case, my friend, please make sure that I see you on the other side.